from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is David Mao, and I have the honor of serving as the law librarian here at the Library of Congress. Thank you, that's, that's very kind. But really, on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, I want to welcome all of you to the James Madison, I'm um, sorry, not the James Madison, I'm so used to saying that across the street because that's where the law library is. Welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Building here at the Library of Congress. And I want to thank you for joining us this morning uh, for this symposium today. Conversations on the Enduring Legacy of the Great Charter. As most of you know, last month, the Library of Congress opened an exhibition, Magna Carta, Muse and Mentor. We had a great ceremony in the Great Hall of this building, and the opening of our exhibition was a way for the library to begin commemoration of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, which takes place next year in June. And it was also a way for us to celebrate the document's important and uh, very, very lasting symbol as a um, marker of liberty and the rule of law. Our exhibition and related events such as this symposium uh, could not, of course, have taken place though without the generous support of sponsors. A full list of all of our sponsors is included in your program, but I would like to mention a few organizations in particular, and they are the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies, First Financial Bank USA, the Burton Foundation for Legal Achievement, Thomson Reuters, the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, BP America, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the law firm of White and Case, and the British Council. Today, today's symposium was developed to spur discussions on how Magna Carta, an 800-year-old medieval document granted by a foreign king in a foreign land laid the foundation to constitutional principles that we as Americans hold dear. And those principles such as the right to due process of law, the right to trial by jury, protection from unlawful imprisonment or the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, uh, and the theory of limited executive are all highlighted in our exhibition upstairs. But this morning we will focus on new historical perspectives of Magna Carta, its relevance in the American age of reason and its impact on colonial and early Republican America. After lunch, we'll have several conversations on the legal and political traditions of Magna Carta in contemporary America. To begin our program this morning, we will hear from Sir Robert Worcester, Chairman of the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Commemoration Committee in the United Kingdom. Sir Robert has been instrumental to the Library of Congress exhibition. Uh, it was he who first approached the library, in fact, uh, to ask us about joining the worldwide celebrations of Magna Carta, and he has given us wonderful advice throughout our planning process, and we're very, very grateful to him for his guidance and for being here with us today. Next, we welcome John Witte, Professor of Law and Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University School of Law, and Joyce Lee Malcolm, Professor of Constitutional Law and the Second Amendment uh, at the George Mason University School of Law to discuss Magna Carta's impact on the early formation of the United States. Uh, Professor Witte will center his presentation on Magna Carta's influence on early modern England to early colonial America, and thereafter, Professor Malcolm will focus on Magna Carta's legacy on, in our country here from colonial to modern times. And then we finish the morning with Professor Renee Lerner from the George Washington University Law School. She will discuss Magna Carta and trial by, trial by jury in the New Republic. So before we begin the program, though, I have a few housekeeping notes to mention. First of all, there is a, uh, an evaluation form in your program, and I ask that you help us fill that form out and give it to the registration desk at the end of this morning's program. And the other more important is that if you could take all of your electronic devices out and put them on the silent mode as this program is being recorded and will be webca webcast and available on the Library of Congress website. So with that, again, I welcome you to the Library of Congress, and thank you for being here, and I hope that you enjoy our program. Good morning. I propose to cover three things in my brief opening remarks this morning. Why me? Why now? Why are you here? Magna Carta's relevance today. 
From an early age, growing up in America, it was good King John the Lionheart, bad King John, Lackland, and Robin Hood and his merry men, not to forget Maid Marian, Little John, Friar Tuck, Will Scarlet, Scarlet and all, Henry VIII, and Elizabeth the Virgin Queen, Shakespeare, 18th century Georgian elegance in costume and architecture and in music. I grew up with the belief that the sun never sets on the British Empire. I collected stamps from all over the British Empire. All Americans knew then that George Washington, John Adams, John Jay, Benjamin Franklin, Sam Adams, nearly all the founding fathers were Englishmen. Alexander Hamilton was a Scot, born in the Caribbean. As they came, so later did settlers from Germany, France, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Poland, Sweden, Swiss, Russians, Chinese, and all the countries who came to the melting pot of America over the past 400 years since the founding of Jamestown in 1607. My parents took me to the New York World's Fair in 1940, just seven years old, to see many of the country's exhibitions and among them, the first time I saw Magna Carta at the British Exhibition. <coughs> it's the 1215 Lincoln Cathedral Magna Carta. And on my first visit to Britain as a serving officer in the United States Army, in 1957, I was returning to America to be discharged after serving in Korea, my tour of duty completed. My first day in London, I went to the British Museum to see two things, the Magna Carta and the Rosetta Stone. To me, they represented the icons of civilization, of a civilized society, <clears throat> the rule of law and communication outside the village. I became a trustee of the Magna Carta Trust 21 years ago when I became chairman of the Pilgrim Society. The chairman of the trust, by charter, is the master of the roles, head of the civil law in the UK. I've worked with six, <coughs> just getting to the end of a cold, and I now serve as the deputy chairman of the trust. As the longest serving member of the trust, I was asked in 2010 to chair the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Commemoration Committee. So today for me is either, or perhaps both, the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end. But how could I refuse? And that's why I'm here and why now? So why are you here? Well, the speakers panel are here because each of them is an expert in their fields. The audience, because we believe in the rule of law. We believe in democracy. We believe in human rights, in freedom of religion, in due process, in trial by jury, in peace, not war. And rather than in the way of kings, emperors, and warlords' use of force and cultural diplomacy we believe in, in soft power. There are many myths which surround Magna Carta, that it was only a fight between the barons and the king, and it didn't really affect the people, that it was a failed peace treaty. Some are demystified in the excellent book published under the title Magna Carta, Muse and Mentor by the Law Library of Congress and Thomson Reuters. And I hope you will all share in reading it. And some of you, Dick Howard I see in the room, helped in writing it. It's an excellent chapter, Dick. Today we'll hear from them about these myths and we'll learn about the truths. Our session this morning carries the title Historical Perspectives on Magna Carta. Carta, you will hear that from them, not me. So that's why I'm here. 38 years ago, in all its splendor, the House of Commons and Lords, ambassadors and high commissioners, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York, met with the senior members of the American Congress and Senate, assembled in the thousand-year-old Palace of Westminster's Westminster Hall, to hand over the Lincoln 1215 Magna Carta to the Library of Congress in the autumn of 2014 to be displayed in the rotunda of the Congress of the United States, and I was there then. So that's why I'm here now. There's one thing not on the program today that I would like everyone to consider here as we are on Capitol Hill at one end of Pennsylvania Avenue with the White House at the other, and here I am I at this podium representing my two countries, Britain and America, who believe and act in the defense of liberty. I would argue that threats to our shared values strengthen the special relationship which bonds 
binds our two countries, Britain and America. President Obama does as well as has every president in my lifetime, going back to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Obama observed in 2001 in a speech to the British Parliament, our system of justice, customs, and values stemmed from our British forefathers. And the president went on to say, our relationship is special because of the values and beliefs that have united our people throughout the ages. Centuries ago, when kings, emperors, and warlords reigned over much of the world, it was the English who first spelled out the rights and liberties of man in Magna Carta. I thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.